Hello and welcome back to our channel. If you don't know us, we are Meg and Cal and we are Flora and the Novice Explorers. Over the last two or three years, we've embarked on quite a big project. We've taken a panel van and we've converted ourselves into a DIY camper van to travel long term, full time, starting July. Yeah. We have changed our logbook and our V5C says we are now a motor caravan. When we started, we knew absolutely nothing about conversion. Our DIY skills were bad at best, weren't they? Uh, we've learned a hell of a lot along the way. Um, we've upcycled, recycled, reused, uh, tried to make something bespoke, personal, bit unique. And basically what you're gonna see is how we did it all. Yes, and this is part one, and there will be more to follow. Yep, just a quick disclaimer. We're not saying this is 100% correct or the right way to do it. This is just how we did it. It's not a how-to video. We always recommend to do your own research before you start your conversion. If you're interested in any of the materials or tools we use, we have put a blog post link that'll be down below. Uh, that'll take you to our own uh, blog at uh, www.campcomforts.co.uk and there's a whole page there dedicated to tools and materials that we've put together for you to have a browse if you see anything you like and want to use. Yes, you'll also find all of our social media links there too. So as we said, this is part one. Three, Roll it. But <laughs> <laughs> Quick. Roll it. Is that coming? One, two, three. <laughs> Step one. Now we have the van, it is time to strip it back to its bare shell. For us, this is a process of removing the old ply lining and floor. This requires a few simple tools, a screwdriver, Torx keys and Allen keys. So before any conversion work began, we wanted to make sure that our van was in tip-top condition. It was important that we identified any potential issues before commencing. We didn't want to be covering up anything that might cause us problems later on down the line. Flora was once a florist delivery van, so checking for things like water damage was essential. Underneath the ply, we found a large amount of compost, soil, twigs and other debris. This had all fallen through the cracks in the floor. We did attempt to remove the lashing points, but decided to work around them. Reason one, they were really hard to remove and we wouldn't really gain much from it. And reason two, it would have left large holes in the floor of the van, which would have needed filling. At this point, we're using WD-40 to help remove the old screws that fix the ply floor straight to the metalwork of the van. We wanted to rectify this, as we don't believe it's the best way to fix the floor down. To treat the holes that were left behind once we removed these screws, we used red oxide metal primer. This makes a few appearances throughout our build. This should help prevent any rust from forming in the future. It's a very simple job, you just paint it on and leave it dry. But after just a few hours and a bit of elbow grease, we've been left with a very clean and very blue van. We were absolutely over the moon with the condition that Flora was in. Obviously, when you buy your van ply lined, you never quite know what's lurking underneath. And now it's on to step two, where the real conversion work begins. Adding sound deadening to your van will reduce the noise whilst driving, reducing the rattle, the road noise and vibrations, making for a more pleasant experience. It's a very easy process and all you need is your sound deadening material. We have used 2mm silent coat which comes self adhesive. You also need something to measure the size required with, something to cut it like a knife or scissors and the optional roller for a neat application. It is a time-consuming job, but it is worth it, and there's something that's quite satisfying about it. We applied strips to the roof, the sides, the doors and the wheel arches. We had a few sheets left over after finding out the van had some factory fitted. We neglected the cab, but we would encourage you to look at yours at this point. All of the products and tools we have used and recommend will be listed in our blog, the links below. We have separate videos for each step of our conversion, but the sound deadening one was created in our early days. It was a bit lacking in info and leaves a lot to be desired, but feel free to check out the playlist and have a giggle at our early videos. 
Next up, we fitted the Caravan's double seat swivel base. We knew this would be a great upgrade to allow us to maximise the space in our relatively small van. This was a great option, as it means that we can keep our twin passenger seat, which once swivelled can be used as more seating and storage. First job was to remove the nuts using a socket wrench or an adjustable spanner. Once removed, it's a simple task of removing the seat and placing it out of the way. Remembering to be cautious with the wiring. This can be stored in a recess under the flooring next to the handbrake. Then it's a case of cutting down the front four bolts. We use a junior hacksaw to do this. However, the bolts can be removed to make this easier depending on what tools you have. We also recommend purchasing the carpet insert, as if you don't, you might struggle to swivel the seat if you're storing items below. This simply sits on top of the base plates and protects it from damage. The chair is placed on top of the newly fitted base and the nuts are tightened back on. This task would be easy if you knew what you were doing. It should take about an hour or so, but for us it took about half a day. It is cumbersome to swivel, but it works well in our setup. Installation is a much debated topic. We highly recommend that you do your own research. However, this is the way we've done it and we must say that we are quite happy with the results. We've used a self-adhesive Dodo Thermo Liner. Much like the Silent Coat, it is very easy to work with. It's a simple job but gets a bit tedious. We covered the sides, roof, doors and wheel arches. We also use it on the floor, but we'll show you that step a bit later on. The Thermo Liner is flexible and malleable, which works perfectly with the curved edges and features in the van. We've used aluminium foil tape to cover the edges where two pieces meet. It makes it look neat and it makes a continuous layer and barrier. We've also used a few rolls of dial recycled plastic loft insulation. This is great for stuffing into cavities. It doesn't absorb moisture which is key. We combine it all with a little Kingspan type insulation. This is for the larger cavities and gaps by the wheel arches. Both of these are very important jobs. By placing down the battens, you're ensuring a much more even surface for a new ply flooring to be put down on. We bought quite a few lengths of wood. We did this job a couple of years ago, so we must admit that we've forgotten our dimensions. However, we do remember that they had to be taller than the ridges on the van floor and just wide enough to slot in between. We mapped out the floor, cutting pieces to fit, focusing a lot more on high traffic areas like the doors and step for a more solid foundation. We then made a number of smaller battens to fit in between the gaps to make it even more sturdy. We didn't want to screw the wood to the body of the van, as we believe it would lead to problems down the line. Instead, we opted to use an adhesive. Sikaflex is our adhesive of choice and it makes an appearance on our build multiple times.
We applied the Sikaflex to the wooden battens and used bricks to keep them in place and make good contact. As you may have noticed, we're using a very old rusty wood saw. Later on in our build process, we purchase a circular saw. We highly recommend them doing that now. With the batten stuck firmly in place, we decided to crack on with the insulation. Again, we used Dodo Thermoliner and foil tape. This was perfect for the job as the Dodo Thermoliner is low profile, giving us a small air gap between the floor and the ply. I really enjoyed this task. I remember looking at the finished job thinking it looked like a spaceship. This task must not be neglected, as insulation keeps you warm or cool when you really need it the most. We bought a ply floor kit online. We weren't confident in making one ourselves as we had very limited skills and only a borrowed jigsaw. So first we had a test run and offered it up. It was very tight and needed to be placed in a certain way in order for it to fit. However, once we figured this out, we were very happy with our purchase. We discovered a few weak areas and had to add more buttons. Our technique seems very trial and error, so we hope that you, the viewer, can learn from our mistakes and save you time and effort. Removing the insulation was a bit of a pain, but very necessary. We had to scrape it off, but that gives us hope that the insulation will remain in place for a very long time. The next hurdle was to ensure that we were successfully screwing the new ply floor into the battens below. This was an issue as we couldn't actually see where they were. We thought the most foolproof option was to create a map of the layout, measuring the distances from features in the van and in relation to each other. Once we were confident, we grabbed our trusty box of screws and a tape measure and got to work. It's important to sink the screws into the wood as much as possible to stop them from poking into the vinyl. We even taped over them to stop this. We were using an old electric drill, but we would highly recommend purchasing an impact driver at this point. In the end, we were very glad that we decided to halt progress temporarily and redo some of the battens. Having a wobbly or uneven floor would have been very annoying and may have damaged the vinyl flooring. We luckily found our roof rack on eBay second hand for a relative steal. It did require a bit of TLC to get it back to its former glory. We started by cleaning it and removing the grime. We were very keen to save money by buying second-hand items where we could. This often meant they needed a little more work to look their best again. We always strive to do the best we can on our first attempt, but sometimes you have to take a step back to be able to step forward and continue. We noticed a few rusty patches, so we attached a brass wire brush to the end of our drill and worked on the affected areas, taking it back to the metal. Once again, we reached for the can of red oxide and gave the areas that we just worked on a coat or two, protecting it from future rust.
Once this had dried, we then applied a coat or two of Hammerite metal paint in smooth black. We finished off by painting the rest of the rack too, just to make it match. Once we'd finished, it looked almost like new. Now it's just a case of fitting it. The Rhino roof rack is designed to fit directly to the existing fittings on a T5's roof. It comes in three parts, which makes it easy to fit. We did ask for a little help getting it up there. We think Flora looks ready for adventure and even beefier. One of our goals for this conversion was to be mostly off-grid. This would enable us to live outside of the campsites. The Rhino roof rack gave us a lot more usable space. Because of this we were able to buy a much larger solar panel and in the end we went for 255 watts. To make the most out of the solar panel we hooked it up to an MPPT charge controller which makes it very efficient. We also have a little MT50 display unit which shows how much power we're producing and using. First up, we measured where the solar panel would best be placed, remembering we wanted to fit as much as we could on the roof rack. We placed it as far forward and far to the right as we could. For this task, we asked for a little help from my dad. He created very simple aluminium brackets to connect the solar panel to the roof rack. We needed to drill suitable holes in both the roof rack and the frame of the solar panel to connect them both together. This requires a good drill and drill bits. Please remember to place a dust sheet over the top of your van to protect it from the swarf, the little metal filings. If these are left, they can cause small rust spots in your paintwork. Yes, you guessed it, we learnt the hard way. But we're hoping to rectify it with some lemon juice and elbow grease. Yeah, we'll make the mistakes so you don't have to. You can thank us later. Now the solar panel is firmly in place, it's time to run the cables inside the vehicle. We wanted to avoid drilling holes into the van. We were lucky to find two holes above the barn doors. We popped out the rubber grommets and we routed the cables through. These cables will soon be hidden behind our ply walls. We ran it through a few tests to make sure it was working. We then replaced the grommets after making small incisions to allow the cables to run through. We then used good old Sikaflex to seal up the hole and make it watertight. This has been in place for a couple years now and is working perfectly. We are very impressed with the amount of solar energy this setup creates. We really don't want to use any other method to charge our batteries, but more on the electrics later. As we've already mentioned, we wanted to maximise the space on the roof rack. We started looking for roof boxes to store some of our larger items in to keep the van clean and tidy, at least in theory. We soon came across the Hapro Rodi 4000. With a 400 litre capacity and a good, smart, solid design, it was the perfect choice. But to make this fit our Rhino roof rack, we had to make an amendment. We started by removing the rear section of the roof rack and making the decision to cut out a bar. We were happy to do this as we hadn't paid a huge price for the roof rack and the bar wasn't structurally important. We used a hacksaw to remove the necessary bar. We filed the rough edges down and painted it with red oxide and black hammerite paint for protection. Time to fit the box. Due to its clever design, it is a tallest installation which makes it very simple. It relies on four internal pincer clasps, these tighten around the bars of the roof rack making a nice strong and sturdy connection. Once that was all done, we lifted the amended section back onto the van and lifted the roof box into position.
and we tightened up the clasp securely. Please don't try this at home, although it does make the van from a two berth into a three berth. It has been a great addition to the van and we couldn't live without it. In our roof box we will be storing our outside table and camping chairs, our awning room and a few other bits and pieces for our European adventure. When looking for lighting for our conversion we had three main criteria we were trying to fulfil. Firstly they had to give off enough light to light up the van but not be too blinding. Secondly, they had to be low profile so that we could install them in our ceiling. And lastly, we wanted them to consume as little power as possible. LEDs would make the perfect choice. We measured out where the lights would be best placed. We removed the van ceiling to make this process easier. It was very much a guess where we were to place the lights, but fortunately we succeeded. Using a hole saw attachment on our drill, we cut out the nearest size hole for the lights to fit. It was a little bit too snug, so a bit of manual filing was required. We used the ceiling that came factory fitted in the van when we bought it. We also decided to keep the existing interior lights, so we knew if we left the doors open, or as backup lighting. We squeezed the lights into their holes and added a couple of screws just for good measure. It was then time to test the lights. We wired them up loosely just to make sure that they were all working. Unfortunately, they were. Time to refit the ceiling. This was a nightmare and your arms ache so much by the end. We had to take the ceiling down once more to re-carpet it and we highly recommend doing both at the same time to avoid the stress and aching arms. The lights were all working but the electrical installation needed some work and tidying up. We had always envisioned our van to look rustic and handmade. We wanted to reuse and upcycle old materials and wood. This would save us money in the long run and create something very unique. We started using pallet wood. Using a pallet wrecker makes the job easy, but you will need to remove all of the old nails and give it a damn good sanding. As this was our first time building a piece of furniture, we cheated ever so slightly. We purchased a commercial van shelving unit made from plywood. We assembled it and used glue and screws to hold it together. We recommend drilling pilot holes when screwing two pieces of wood together. Yes, you may already know this, but we didn't and neglected it and it caused us a few problems and frustration along the way. We gave the unit a light sanding with a hand sander in preparation for painting later on. Meg had done a few hand-drawn sketches of what we wanted to create. We were thinking of making cupboard doors out of pallet wood and a curtain that was slid across on a piece of copper piping. We brought a length of copper pipe and cut it to size using a small pipe cutter. We made a few brackets to hold it in place.
We painted the shelf in grey matte emulsion. At this point, interior design decisions were being made. Things like our colour scheme, materials and van aesthetic. Painting it grey made it feel less commercial and more camper van. Once all the pieces were painted, we screwed it back together. Once the base unit was finished, we could start creating the pallet wood doors. We chose the best pieces of pallet wood that we had. We went with the most interesting shades and textures to make it more of a feature in the van. We started by laying them out and trimming them to size. At this stage we began experimenting with various varnishes and stains, but we much preferred the natural wood look. We tested out a few accent paint colours on some off cuts and decided on a blue piece every now and again, but not to overdo it. This shade of blue is actually very close to Flora's exterior. We sanded the blue chalk paint back in a shabby chic style and used a dark wax to age the pieces and make it look more in keeping. Sanding every piece of pallet wood took an age, but once we were happy with all of our pieces, we laid them out in order and started to create the cupboard doors. We used offcuts of wood we had as braces and they also doubled up as places to attach our hinges. It took us quite a few attempts to get our heads around hinges and where they needed to be placed. However, once we figured them out, they were glued and screwed into place. Fortunately, this process got a lot easier with each hinge. However, we're still not quite experts on the subject. Considering this is our first go at making furniture, I don't think we did too bad. We're actually really happy with the results. We screwed the hinges to the base unit and our basic design was nearly complete. This unit slowly evolved during our van build. A little more trial and error, but it turns out great in the end and sets the theme for the rest of the van conversion. So thank you very much if you managed to make it this far through the video. We do appreciate it. We hope you found it somewhat useful. Yes, give us a thumbs up if you found any of our information uh, useful. And give us a like, share and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Yeah. If any of your friends or family are going to do a conversion, please share the, this video if you think it'll be of any use at all. Hopefully it will, we're not sure. And hopefully it'll give you a bit of confidence because as you saw, we started at absolute zero and came out with something quite good in the end. Yes, and if I say so myself, you are the video editor and the editing skills come on a lot in the next part too. So stay tuned for that and thanks for watching. We'll see you in part two and our future adventures beyond this. <laughs> we'll see you in part two. Bye. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> One take.